Sir, whenever you are ready, you can start. Yeah, we'll wait for just two more minutes and we'll go. Okay. Yeah, so we'll put just two minutes and then the people are joining. Yeah. Shall we start now? Yes, sir. So, good evening to all of you. I think this is the 77th session. I will screen my share. Okay, is my slide um, seen to you all? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Okay, we'll, as usual, we'll start with the short case. This is a story of a 27-year-old policeman. He noticed numbers of the left little finger one week back when he got up from sleep. One day later, he noticed similar numbers of the right little finger. Two days later, he noticed that he could not hold water in his both hands and it used to drip down between the fingers and, and also difficulty in making a ball of wood while when, when, you, when you does that, the middle two fingers will not work properly. You can do make a bolus only with the lateral three fingers. There is a past history. On the day prior to the onset of the numbness, he was sleeping in the floor because some other some guest came to his house. He was he was he was supposed to lie on the floor and he slept on the floor. Two days prior to the first symptom, that is prior to this onset of the symptom. He was posted to take police duty in the Trishur Puram to control the mob. <coughs> this is the past history. Let us see the examination finding. Bone was normal. Entoid power normal. Dice of normal. Dice of normal. This is normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In bilateral claw hand deformity, claw hand deformity, ulnar claw hand, the needle two fingers are more broad than the other fingers. This question is normal. Picture flexes are all normal. Flexor policy is longest, normal. 
but supported his bravish nominal. Also, is nominal or the state, so also for supported his bravish. And in Trushi, Trushi all week, medium was weak, steadily on the other side, but to see Trushi, it can be a number of kills and other Trushi are also weak. Moment side was positive by that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. the were all the mainly of the rich people. Then was normal. And they specifically check the FTP, but the digital performance of all the pictures. The that will be that is normal. Pink finger and it will be also normal. Then the middle finger, FTP, pink finger, the little finger is also normal. But to keep in hands like that, there is no getting out of the middle to fingers. But flex all the fingers equally well. And the sensations, if the crease of the middle palm, you tell you where it is more, there it is more. I ask you where it becomes normal, there it becomes normal. The dorsal surface, there is no difference between the middle and lateral part. He said same all throughout. He said same. Hello. Yeah. No, you know, yes, sorry, the current line can't went off. Is it all right now? Yes, yes, it's all right. Okay. You can see that, no? Okay. Right. I play from the last part. Idam, idam, same. 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 The flesh is called normal properly, and so that's the lower limb. The rest of the findings are all normal in the lower limb. So, on examination, he had bilateral pro hand deformity, weakness of Hypothena muscles, all intrusion, middle to lumbricals, and adductor pollicis of both hands. Other muscles were normal. Eta normal. The sensor system embed pain over the palm are respect to the both little fingers and middle palm. Now, uh, where is the localization? What is likely diagnosed in this patient? 
He noticed acutely to one week back. Alnana or below flexor digital fundus. You mean where exactly would you like to postulate? Is it at the wrist or forearm? Or... Yeah, we are right. So, what could be likely etiology in this patient? Pressure pulse. But where could be the pressure pulse in this patient? He was lying on the floor the day prior, but both Alnana nerves got affected, no? Usually, when lying on the floor, it's usually not get compressed, it's radial now. Yes, sir. And that too, bilateral. And not below the branch to flux with the term profundus. Yeah. So, what could be the etiology? Anyway, let us see the investigations. Now, what do you want now first? Nerve conduction. Nerve conduction. So this is the nerve conduction. Look the conduction carefully. Left ulnar, the amplitude is low. The look at the velocity is uh, the forearm. It is forty six and approximately thirty. Right ulnar again, amplitude is very low. The conduction velocity is thirty nine and twenty nine. Left ulnar, low amplitude. Right, they pick up from the FTI again, low amplitude. Okay. Now, sensory, what was this decrease in the uh, uh, in, in ulna nerve from the digit 5? FA latency is blocked bilaterally. So, what does it tell you? Again, ulna nerve in mono. Oh, so, where is the site of affection as um, Ramesh correctly told? It is it at the wrist. It could be because there is pairing of the FTP and FCU. There is flexor digitorum profundus of any middle to fingers and flexor carpi ulnaris. So, that tells you lesion is likely to be proximal to the wrist. But mind you, these two muscles can be spared even if the compression is at the elbow. Okay, that does not exclude that possibility because of the fascicular vulnerability. So these muscles, will not, even if least is at the elbow, sometimes these muscles may be quite strong. So, and the other point is the sparing of sensation, the distribution of the dorsal cutaneous of the ulna now, which again tells you least is not at the wrist, is proximal to the wrist. Okay. So, uh, sorry, it is distal to the wrist, at the, at the wrist and not proximal. Somewhere around at the wrist is the site of lesion. So, what else you want to do to find out the site of lesion? Look for the sensory potential, the dorsal cutaneous nerve. See, this is the, the digit 5, it is decreased. Look at the pickup from the dorsal cutaneous nerve distribution, it is normal. The conclusion will tell you that lesion is likely to be at the wrist and not above, above below the forearm, just above the wrist. You got the point? Yes. Yeah, because it is occurring after the supply of the dorsal cutaneous nerve. So we know the lesion is at the wrist now. Now, what could be the etiology? Um, bilateral is some pressure pulse. Okay. So what will you want to do now? Or what will ask the patient? Okay. Job. Let us see. Now, what I asked him, was again asking him. Hand, was he lying with the hand below the uh, head, you know? Yeah, that's a good thing you have to think. You have to keep both hands behind the head. Correct? Generally, generally this can occur. Not one hand. Because it's both are not as got affected. Yeah. That's a very unusual situation. So I was going to asking him, was he mopping his hand with both hands? He, he did not tell anything. Then after some time, he came up with this history. That means he was holding a big choir rope for, for continuously for four hours to control the mob like, like uh, this, which I'm going to show. But there was a Trishur Param, there was a lot of people, you know, you had to control the people. So he was holding a large rope with both hands like this, continuously for four yeah. hours. So that could be the cause. This is the way I was demonstrating this, he was demonstrating this is how he is holding it for four hours. So, but even then, do, don't you think that this is likely can cause pressure pulse in the wrist? 
but it is not clear you see but the palmar palmar cutaneous nerve is involved here no palmar cutaneous is affected but not the dorsal cutaneous nerve the tensile yeah. disc is at the wrist the palmar cutaneous nerve also just above the wrist only it comes no yeah come, correct but not proximal to that but so it is it is like this, if it is holding like this it will not be involved no the palmar cutaneous it, it can somebody is holding it tight no it's holding it tight in the flexed position is it continuously for four hours Palmar cutaneous nerve after supplying the tongue coming through the palmar side, no? You can get compressed there itself. Usually with this posture, what will you get is deep ulnar neuropathy bilateral, no? No, no. Then okay. even the Guyon's canal, even the Guyon's canal involvement, you can get cutaneous nerve affection of the ulnar nerve, palmar cutaneous nerve. Because the palmar cutaneous are just proximal to the Guyon's canal. It separates them. So if the lesion is under Guyon's canal, there, there are four types of Guyon's canal involvement. The one type, the proximal type, you get sensory involvement also. Yes. But in that type, those of your tennis nerve will be spread. spread. So the least is at Kyron's canal. Mm. Not a deeper part, the proximal part of the Kyron's canal. Now let us see, first of all, see both the lines, but it's got a, now the problem is, has he got a liability for pressure palsy? To affect both or none simultaneously with that thing. Possible. Now let us see. Look at the NCA study, the upper limb once again. See, any, I'm showing the same NCA study which I have shown before. Anything abnormal? Which I have circled out? The conduction velocity across the elbow is prolonged. See, distally it is 46 in the forearm segment. Across the elbow, it is 30. It is 29. 39 to 29. You got the point. That means there is some slowing across the elbow as well. So this is an indirect clue to tell that the patient might have been having some tendency for pressure pulse even before. That is why he got, even with that, even holding the rope like that, he could buy that severe affection of the ulnar nerve. So it this can it, normally happen, sir. This, this sort of a milder decrease in the proximal segment, we usually, usually we see, no? No, no, they just the opposite. The proximal segment, the conduction velocity will be more. More. Compared to the initial segment, just the opposite. Because the proximal nerves are thicker, more thicker. So always the velocity will be more in the proximal part than the distal part. If you get the reverse, always think of a proximal lesion. Okay, sir. Like this. Okay, there is, I, in fact, I should have done the conduction of the other things also. But in some or other, I did not do that because the OPD, so I just saw the, I found out the subnormality only yesterday. So put him in a short course of steroid and send him. How did he come from Trishur to Trivandrum? No, no, no. He was posted in Trishur Pura appointment for duty in Trishur Pura. Okay. <laughs> he, he, he was staying somewhere in the, in the southern I mean, part time on that part. Okay. Shall I go to the next case? For any questions in that case, anyone? You should have gone to Dr. Joy. <laughs> Pardon? You should have gone to Joy. <laughs> <laughs> sir, there's four types of Guyan canal involvement you said, sir. Can you yeah. just explain on that? Yeah, if you want, I can show you the guy, give the picture again. I mean, uh, I've got a good picture I have uh, copied it from there. But anyway, I'll tell you that uh, for the sake. There are four types. In fact, the proximal part from the ulnar nerve, it supplies it, it, the sensory part gives off. Then it supplies the nerve to the supplying the thena, hypothena muscles. Okay. Then the uh, deep branch arises. From the deep branch supplies the deeper part of the one. And one more thing, uh, just one more, just one minute. That one is a sensory first, then hypothena muscles. Uh, then comes the deep branch. Okay. 
if in the distalmost part only the deep branch will be affected so it produces only weakness of the introsiae and adductor pollicis okay that is one type one the distalmost one just to proximal to that you get hypothenar muscle affection but sensory is pain so you get hypothenar muscle plus the uh, the introsiae and adductor pollicis just proximal to that all three will be affected sensory just like our patient Mm-hmm. Then sensory hypothenar rentrosia. Then the fourth type is only the sensory part is affected. Sir, one or two patient, one or two, one or two, one or two, one or two, one or two. That time I gave it, showed you the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, three months ago, sir. Okay. Yeah. The machine work is beginning. Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. okay. I work on that. The alone also can occur, sir. Yeah, the sensory part alone can be affected. That also I have shown you one case. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then only the sensory part is affected. So that these are the four types of uh, Guyon's canal affection. Next time I'll that show that picture to you, where the site of lesion and, and, and the various type, various various sites of involvement in the Guyon's canal involvement. Some missionary, but at the point the missionary is touching that area. Touching that alnar sensory, yeah, and yeah. it would only answer alnar sensory involvement. Ah, sir, a missionary can't do that. Okay. 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 Right. So I'll go to another interesting case. This is a story of a sixty-year-old diabetic man with two types of resistant diabetic. with borderline renal 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 dysfunction serum creatinine is only 2 came with history of difficulty in walking for the last two months he said he had to put extra effort to move his legs forward something like a stiffness of the legs that was his complaint he did not consult any doctor for these complaints he started losing weight and consulted the physician The investigation revealed worsening of his renal function. His serum creatinine shot up to five, and was being planned for dialysis. Okay, so chronic diabetic with the borderline renal dysfunction, notice stiffness or some kind of heaviness in walking on the low heaviness of the lower limb while walking, and then started losing weight. Re-examination revealed worsening of the renal function. An elevated serum creatinine. So for dialysis, an arterial shunt was put on the left elbow two weeks back, and he says on the same day, immediately after putting the shunt, he noticed numbness and total weakness in the left hand. That is his version. No root pain, no complaints in the right upper limb. For a precipitance and mixturation. That is on leading question. Okay, so shall I go to this one examination finding? So a little careful about the examination. Interesting. Let's put you the emaciated man. The old muscle, his muscles are wasted. Over the biceps is normal on the right side. Biceps is also normal. This section is normal on the right side, mainly, but severely weak on the left side. Zero power. Increases are also all zero power. On the right side also it is weak, even though you said it's only right left side. Right side also weak. The finger is also weak on the right side. Small muscles of the hand are also weak on the right, but severely affected on the left side. Protective pollicis is long as B, but support is almost zero power. But support is long as zero, very zero. Protection of the wrist is only one, just. And he keep his hand and goes in. He cannot keep it connected. He cannot keep it connected. Goes backward. That means he will be connected to this. You know, Malathi put it. You know, what are the same? You know, you know, you know. So please, you know, please, 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 please
കൂടുകയാണെങ്കിൽ മാത്രമേ പറയാവൂ ഇപ്പോഴാണ് 
ഇനി ഈ വെച്ചതും ഈ വെച്ചതും വ്യത്യാസം ഉണ്ടോ ഇവിടെ ഇനി ഒരു ചോദ്യം കൂടെ ലാസ്റ്റ് ഇവിടെ തൊടുന്നതും വ്യത്യാസം ഉണ്ടോ So, I'll, uh, so, what are the exam, summarizing the examination findings. He's an emaciated old man. High milk functions were normal. Painless were normal. Motor system, not normal in the biceps and pronators. Placidity of the left wrist. Normal tone the lower limbs. Coming to the power, great zero power of the left upper limb. Great zero power of the thena. Hypothena, introshi, finger extensors, finger flexors of the left hand, and extensors of the left thumb, and wrist extension, and grade 2 power of wrist flexion. Weakness of both pronation and supination. Pronation is more severely weak, could not keep his hand in the mid-prone position, it goes into supination. Normal power of the bice- deltoid, biceps, triceps, and brachial area. The right upper limb, weakness of finger flex extensis, hypothenar, introshi, and adductor policies. Mild weakness of thena muscles, finger flexion, and pronation supination of the right forearm. Lower limb, grade 3 power of both hip flexes. All of the muscles are 4 to 4 plus, but they are all weak. Detailed biceps supinate rejects 2 plus bilaterally. Prices 1 plus bilaterally, slightly less on the left side. I said it is less. Bigger fresh is absent bilaterally. Knee check, 1 plus bilaterally, both angle checks are absent. Abdominance is a picker of movement. Panda, up going left, indefinite on the right side. Sensor system, upper limbs, left upper limb, severe loss of pain, touch, vibration, and position sense of the whole hand. Pain and touch level above. At about the level of the wrist. Right upper limb, embed, touch, pain, vibration joints in the right little finger. Other, other areas may be affected to a mild extent. Mild embedment at touch in the whole right hand. Lower limb stalking type of sensory loss for all modalities. So, this is the story. If you want any clarification, you want to see the video once again, muscle testing, I can show. So, mononeuritis multiplex with myelopathy and peripheral neuropathy. Okay. Perfect. Any other possibility? Myelopathy. Well, chronic, a chronic pathology and the background of chronic pathology had an acute pathology also, sir. So, two possibilities. Sir. Can you tell me one second? Uh, he had a chronic uh, uh, quadriparsis uh, on which he had acute presentation in the left upper limb. So we had to get two pathologies. Okay, two. No, okay, right. But it's a right upper is also affected. Uh, that we don't know when she is having a because he was complaining yeah, of yeah, only yeah, lower limbs yeah. in the his complaint was only in the left side, but the distribution also almost the same in the right limb bars as well. See, it may have been affected earlier as you said correctly, perfectly right. So I have got one suggestion. Yeah. He has got a myelopathy and the peripheral neuropathy. Yeah. And, addition, and correlating with the history, probably had a, he had an anterior spinal artery embolism and a, uh, yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah. Right. But he has got impaired vibration. Everything is affected on the right hand. Left hand as well as on the right hand. Not only really pain. Uh, Sometimes that can work uh, because angi spinal artery uh, is not that strictly confined to. Yeah, you can because uh, you, you are, uh, sometimes it need not necessarily be confined to the angi spinal artery. Some of the radical artery compromise can affect both the tertiary, both posterior spinal as well as angi spinal. Yes. Yeah. 
but we can't call it antispinal, but maybe ischemic myeloid. Yeah, right. Right. But Good. ischemic myelopathy can't explain the complete loss of pain, temperature, vibration only left upper lip, left hand up to the wrist. You know, that what what Monser was telling is that you know you don't think of an antispinal artery, but this post spinal artery might have also been compromised. Because radicular artery, are, 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 what they do is they replenish the supply of the anterior posterior spinal artery. So when the radicular arteries are compromised, sometimes ischemic can manifest in the posterior spinal artery territory as well. Okay, we are not thinking in terms of a pure anterior spinal artery. Okay, so whenever you get a myeloprene, and you got element findings. Don't you think some minor radiculopathy is a possibility? Your anterior home cell involvement can explain that. And, you know, but you guys sensitive also is there, no? Your More like a mononeuritis multiplex and peripheral neuropathy in the lower limbs. Right. Let us see and raise the problem. Okay. And this paraneoplastic sir. Okay. Very good. And it's CL lung. <laughs> <laughs> This was discussed before, sir. Okay, perfect. I think you remember that. Because I thought you must have forgotten. <laughs> this is a good localization. I brought the case only because of a good localization. Let us see that analyze the patient. Radical unlikely because the yeah. uh, is uh, preserved, whereas the uh, wrist uh, extension dysfunction is involved. That, that, that's the thing I wanted to you to tell. That is. Yeah. Now let us see the analyst the case, the case for the at least for the juniors who has not seen the case. First, we have to find out whether the weakness is upper limb weakness, LMN and UMN. The weakness is not in the distribution of UMN pattern, obviously, because there is severe weakness of the finger flexes with spade of deltoid and biceps. So that tells you that it cannot occur with the UMN lesion. And severe weakness of the pronators compared to the supination. Whereas the pronatory is more uh, less affected compared to the supination in the case of UMH. So what I'm trying to say is that find out the distribution of the weakness. But the possibility of a cortical lesion cannot be entirely ruled out. And the and total loss of sensation for all modalities also makes a lesion of the cortical unlikely for a cortical localization. So it's unlikely for a perimeter lesion. And of course, flaccidity of the distal muscles. And absent finger flexion. These are all points against the human lesion. Because why I'm telling human lesion? Because he has got an upgoing plantar on one side. So you have to, in the back of the mind, you have to keep whether it could be human weakness in the upper limb as well. That is why I'm trying to tell you the distribution of muscle weakness is not fitting with the human lesion. Now let us see if I know whether it's element and human. So what are the, where if it is element, where all could be the lesion? Is it a radiculopathy? Unlikely, what are the points again is radiculopathy? Because the motor weakness and sensory loss are not in the distribution of the roots. Now, can you tell me the point by which it cannot be radiculopathy? Forget about the other findings. Take looking at the distribution of muscle weakness alone. Biceps reflect this period. Yeah, not only that, see that. It's got a severe finger extensive weakness of zero, but as you said, crisis power is normal, crisis reflux is no spied. So that means it is, cannot be a C7 radical. Second point, he has got supernatal is zero. Sorry, bronated terrace is zero. He cannot hold the hand. But biceps is normal, deltoid is normal. So that tells you it cannot be a radical. So then we are excluding one by one. So whenever you get a myelopathy, natural tendency will be to think of radicular myelopathy. That's a common sense tell you. But this is not fitting with the root distribution. Let us see what there could be a plexus lesion. What is against a middle and lower tongue in modern Responsible for the weakness. If it may somebody ask you why not, then you have to tell me the points. So again, triceps reflex. But triceps reflex can be lost in the middle trunk. Uh, this is not lost, no? Uh, it's not lost, correct. That's one point. Second thing. Again, triceps point, must be spread. 
prioritary is weak zero power which cannot dispense by a middle trunk or lower trunk yeah so upper trunk so weakness of figure extension is paired traces muscle as joy has told the normal traces reflex and weakness of the pronator so this is not going with the middle lower trunk then can it be then can we think of a medial and posterior cord again unlikely because deltoid is paired posterior cord involvement can explain the finger extension of weakness but not the triceps yes but triceps weakness as well as the deltoid to be involved so they are so deltoid is paired so also triceps and brachioid is also separate with the posterior cord they are paired in this fashion so it's a distribution does not favor either a medial and medial middle or lower trunk involvement or a level at the least at the level of the cord cord level medial posterior cord also is against so again weakness of pronator is against a posterior or medial cord because that's come through the lateral cord so one doubt sir then so the dentary involvement can we cannot be explained also by medial and lower trunk any medial sensitive can be explained by the involvement of the trunk or the lower so involvement trunk. cannot be explained by that's what is telling by okay. the medial and the exactly uh, but exactly is correct on the left side because the thumb involvement here on the in the left hand is affected mean that has to be coming through the lateral cord correct that's also another point what is said is correct to what i'm trying to hide is only the motor part of it because sensory people may some days confuse that's why i did not stress on that But you already said is perfectly right. Sensory involvement does not fit. Now multiple nerves. That's the most possible localization. But all three nerves has to be implicated. That is radial nerve below the elbow, not above that because triceps is weak as I said. And below the supply of the brachial radial is because the brachial radial is supplied by the radial. Malna nerve as well as medial nerve at elbow before the supply of the pronated teres. So these are the three possible sites. I mean, these are the three nerves to be implicated, and in the in, in the nerve, these are the sites we are to implicate. You cannot just say it is radial nerve because it is distal to the supply of the triceps and brachial radius. Because this brachial uh, radius supply is coming above the elbow, so just below the elbow is radially is affected. Another nerve can be affected anywhere. Medial nerve at the elbow before the supply of the pronator teres because pronator teres is also affected. So it is just above the elbow. The fact that weakness and sensory loss in the right ulnar nerve also is favor this localization, the sensory part. Now coming to the lower limb weakness, is it human or ulnar? Plantar is upgoing, so, and it more likely favors an human lesion to account for the weakness of the lower limb, and he has got a weak. Cortices with an intact DTR that also slightly favors that likely to be, but nobody can be absolutely sure whether it's a left component is not there in this fish. But all muscles are affected, and plantar is up going naturally, and reflexes are retained in the knee, so that would be more favoring your muscles. And the weakness is not in the distribution of the nerves unless you implicate all the nerves, so it's unlikely to be an left lesion. Because you are thinking of element in the upper limb, then naturally you have tendency to diagnose lower limb weakness also to be element. That's a logical thing. The localization of the multiple nerves, but lower limb weakness cannot be explained by any of the element sites. So you have to think more like a element. There is some kind of sort of exclusion diagnosis for lower limb weakness, except for the upper limb. So the final localization is pyramidal tract, maybe anywhere in the spinal cord or in the brain. We don't know where it is at. element weakness of upper limb multiple nerves or multiple radiculopathy in your associate myelopathy even the weakness is not fit in the rule these are things you have to keep in mind the rare possibilities but it's a three core it's very unlikely for a radiculopathy so more likely multiple nerves because the combination of myelopathy and multiple nerve is very unusual combination that's why i kept the radiculopathy also in the back of my mind so what do you want now MRI is normal. This is the MRI axial cut. Okay, MRI is normal now. There's no explanation for his 
pyramidal tract involvement. And what do you what else you need now? Nerve conduction. Okay, and MRI the brain. Because you have to explain the weakness, pyramidal weakness. That there's something in the cord. So we have to find an explanation why the pyramidal tract is affected. So you have to screen the brain also. That is also normal. This is the conduction abnormality. You find that in the left median is totally inelicitable. The right median amplitude is very low. The right radial, again low. Left is not at all elicitable. Right ulna, again low on right side, not elicitable on the left side. Lower limb peroneal, both peroneal and not uh, left peroneal and left tibial inelicitable because the distal muscle wasting is must have occurred. And come to FA, okay, FA is the, and the, and the, this cannot be relied upon because the amplitude is very low. So you cannot give any importance to the FA latencies. Right median FA latency is not 35, lightly prolonged. Then, uh, this is sensory studies, right median 7.2 microvolt, absent in the left median, right radial decreased, left radial absent, both right and left is absent, lower limb sorely is absent, and Peroni is absent. So, what does it tell you this in CV? Then we get one possible to have multiple true plus final cord. Where there is one favored combination which we get, but that is unlikely because snaps are all absent. So that's radiculopathy part is out. So you have to think necessarily either a plexopathy or a neuropathy. Plexopathy, the reasons we are we consider unlikely because the points which has already been told. So more likely multiple nerves are affected. So now what? So unlikely to be in the trunk. Because loss of snap in the median nerve distribution D2 suggests that upper trunk will lateral cord as well. So it cannot be in the middle or lower trunk because the but it's already pointed out sensory losses confirmed now in the index finger that is supplied through the upper trunk. So it so is it can be seen partial effects of all the all the whole of the plexus, partial yeah. affection of all of the yeah. plexus, whole plexus. Yeah, that's possible. That's possible. But the only point is that in, in let's think of a lateral cord involvement or upper trunk involvement partial. See, it's so severe involvement of the breaker radii as a pronator with the normal power of the delta. If some weakness part agreed, that combination is flawed. Suppose, suppose it's say a gate four one and gate two one another, okay. But zero power of the pronator and gate five power of the deltoid and the biceps. That is little odd for any uh, upper trunk or the lateral cord involvement. Uh, makes sound like it. Even if you think of a partial involvement. Okay. Like if the cord or the trunk of the brachial plexus. Similarly, radial snap is also affected again, suggesting the effects on the upper trunk and the lateral cord. So radial snap is also lost, indicating that the upper trunk is affected, lateral cord is affected. So these are all points against the upper trunk and middle trunk or the lateral and medial cord. Yeah, sorry, medial and um, posterior cord. Okay. This is the point again. Even though sensory part can be explained, muscles in the DT of the upper cord are spared in this patient. That is a point against so why we say this, they cannot think of a partial lateral cord. So NCS suggests a affection of multiple nerves plus myelopathy. So MRA is negative. So what is likely diagnosis? What do you want? Paraneoplastic. Yeah, what is a paraneoplastic? So this patient, as the eyes already told, had a lung lesion, carcinoma of the lung. This, this lesion we picked up only much later. In fact, he came for dialysis. He came for elevated renal dysfunction and for dialysis, but the neurological deficit made us suspect that is paranoia. We really found out this lesion. Okay. So 
okay. Now, I brought this case because of the difficulty in localization. Any questions in this case? Where is the mile of the exact site? So, you know, we where cannot I... say in, in, in all non compressive mile of these. We cannot clearly say where it is affected. It may be in, in the so called tractopathy due to perineal process syndrome. Some, some of them do show MRI abnormality, some of them do not show. The MRI abnormality can span over the entire length of spinal cord sometimes. Maybe hyperlensity is seen longitudinally in the tract. It may be confined to the perimeter tract, it may be confined to the posterior column, it may be confined to the both posterior and lateral column, and maybe even in the hemispheres in the, along the perimeter tract, in the paramilist, paramilist, paramilist syndrome. So where exactly it is affected, we don't. If you find a hyperdensity, then that tells you more likely that is a site of the usual 1.5 in the And then even on the 1.5, you can see that I have seen Tractopathy, I mean, hyperdensity in the perimeter tract due to perineum syndrome. Long yeah, hyperdensity. Except, except for plantar extensor, what are the signs of perineal lesion in this patient, sir? No, what you are thinking is very, very logical. Very logical. Because if you got a clear LML lesion in the upper limb, naturally one would consider LML lesion in the lower limb as well. Perfectly right. Now, the only point is the big plant. And yeah. second thing, the reflex, the weak muscle, the reflex in the upper limb, you see the, the affected muscles have got absent reflex. But here, the affected muscles got a retained reflex, for example, the knee jack. And knee jack, we can't give credence because he's a diabetic. The weakness can be due to the uremia also, so myopathy involved because the creatinine is very much high. That can be the muscle involvement due to the uremia. That can explain the normal. Uh, uh, low muscle power with uh, retained reflexes. So then there you have to bring you to another etiology here. You know, basically, your thing, she has got a multiple nerve involvement plus myopathy, uremic myopathy, and then diabetic neuropathy. Again, I'm being that I can't be explained. The taking the being planned are a diffuse weakness of both the lower limb, not fitting with a nerve or a root distribution. You think you have more likely perimeter lesion. And his complaint, remember the complaint, his complaint was severity of the low wind while walking. So his thing is partial sitting. So, it, it was, so your possibility can be excluded, but a subtle point favoring a perimeter. Yeah, can we get similar uh, findings in diabetics? Eh? Diabetic uh, acute uh, mononeurosis multiplex type of presentation. Even in, in, if you get multiple extensive nerve involvement like that with in a diabetes, you think of a CADP complicating diabetes, like it is. Very good extensive element paralysis, the reflex here. You think of that possibility. But all nerves to be affected in a diabetes that is equivalent to CADP. In upper limb involvement in diabetes, usually in those nerves such as liable for pressure pulse are affected. They get ulnar nerve involvement. Other nerve involvement in the upper limb due to diabetes is uncommon. If upper limb involvement is multiple nerves are affected in a diabetes, think of it associated CAD if it's not due to diabetes. Shall we go to the next case? Any questions regarding the localization subway? That's why I, I wanted to, to ask that thing. Not serious, only juniors. The nerve involvement in the upper limb, sir. Yeah. They are at, at the level of elbow. So all the three nerves are affected at a particular level. So it need not be then uh, mononeuritis multiplex now. It may be just a peripheral neuropathy, you know, it's like ascending up, no? Yeah. No, it, it is not a peripheral neuropathy. See, if you imagine that it's a peripheral neuropathy, you expect 
all the muscles are affecting in a distal symmetrical pattern, or even if you are preliminary pattern. That's not the pattern here. For example, if you take the pronator, pronator is zero, so pronator is about three. If you take, if you take the on the right side, finger extensors has uh, one more one finger flexors are good power. So that pattern is not uh, peripheral peripheral pattern. So it's like a monoiderous multiplex then. Yeah, it's like a monoiderous multiplex. Very doubt. Then yeah. uh, diabetic amyotrophy occur in the upper limb. Yes, upper it can. Limb, without, involved, without involving the lower limb. Yeah, the diabetes can affect the upper limb, can affect the trunk, can affect the lower limb. Most common is the lower limb proximal. Diabetic amyotrophy can affect the proximal muscles, the lower limb, that's most common. It can affect the distal muscles, but usually along with the proximal muscles. It can be affected the thoracolumbar, thoracic region, and the trungal muscles can be affected. Can affect me in the even the upper limbs uh, can be affected in amyotrophy. The classical amyotrophy in the upper limb the, sorry, is uh, the one which is indolent, only presenting with wasting of the hand muscles. This point only mentioned the prices test book of medicine. So many people with chronic diabetes, if you see, you may find that this way they, they absolutely not complain, but you will find wasting of the small muscles in the hand. Both thin and hypothetical. They're totally symptomatic. They are not bothered about it. But if you can conduct sensory, may be normal, but if the muscles may be wasted and normal. So that thing, they usually, it was called as a diabetic amyotrophy in the upper limb, in the upper limb in the prices test book of medicine. Yes. Apart from that, apart from that, just like our diabetic amyotrophy in the lower limb can also occur in the upper limb proximal region. Upper limb distal only, uh, why can't it be just motor neuropathy of diabetes? Yeah, that's correct. It's be motor yeah, correct. That is the thing. In fact, your question is very, very valid. That is, I also think. But this is the term they given for that thing. Because the patient has been symptomatic for quite a long time, only wasting, no other complaint. The power is not totally zero or anything. There are no complaint regarding the upper limb. I think you, if you... In your practice, you must have seen person chronic diabetic with wasting of small muscles and taught case of diabetic. I have seen many patients. They are not bothered about it. They are not bothered about it. And physicians are also not bothered about it. That's a key for the thing. We are not bothered. Sometimes they Sometimes, actually last week I had a patient who was referred by a physician to rule out a motor neuron disease because of this yeah. wasting. Correct, correct. And there was some... Yeah. Yeah. We also see that we ignore them usually because he has not complained. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shall I go to the next case? Yes, sir. Okay. This is another interesting case. It's a short case, in fact. It's a story of a 45 year old man. He's still aching pain on the back for the last one month. No radiation of pain along both the lower limbs. But he complained of numbness, paresthesia on the lateral side of both thighs for the last three weeks, something like a mimicking a neuralgia paresthetica. He gave a buckling of both knees or timing downstairs and difficulty in getting up in squatting positions for the last two weeks. That is the main complaint by which he came. He still have loosening of the chapels for the last two weeks. And the deficit is statics since then. See, it progressed for two initial two weeks, then remained static for two weeks. He came because he was investigated uh, with the uh, scan and all, but he is not improving. That is why he came. This is the video. You want the history once again? Aching pain in the back for the last one month. No radiation of pain along both the lower limbs. Number is the lateral side of both thighs. History of buckling of both knees and climbing downstairs and difficulty in getting up in squatting position. History of loosening of the chapels for the last two weeks. And the deficit static for the last two weeks. For examination, nailers are all normal. Upper lip normal. The third normal. Prices. 
So, some of the findings. Tone normal in both upper and lower limb. Motor weakness of both hip flexes. Knee extensors right more than the left, about grade 4. Weakness of both hip abductors, grade 2 plus on the right side, 4 on the left side. Adductors normal both sides. Hip extensors 4 on the right, 4 plus on the left side. Weakness of both rows of flexors of angle more on the right side. EHL weak bilaterally, plantar flexors normal. DTR, Najex absent bilaterally, and Najex normal, sensitivities are normal. SLR negative. Now I'll put the motor part, this is the motor findings. If anyone wants to see the video, please tell me I can show the video once again. Okay. He's not a diabetic.
okay so where is a localization in this patient epicornus with radicular epicornus with radicular epicornus with radicular we mean to say both epicornus as well as quadricornus or no. you will say only epicornus bar quadricornus epicornus plus the bilateral to radicular no you mean to say so then why don't you then extend upward and say cornus epicornus lesion so epicornus lesion epicornus yeah we know why do you want to bring radicular epi along with that okay exceptionally you no know, sensory finding your plantar is uh, down going ിയ <laughs> 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 multiple extensors are involved no so l5 ah extensors are involved so the extensors involved means it can be l5 as well correct but extensor involvement does not always mean that is radical it can be involved due to other things as well other conditions as well yes no sensory yes no root pain only some subjectively you are telling symptom wise is telling paresthesia the lateral thigh but no objective sensory okay any other possibility you want to keep anyone so let us analyze the problem pure motor weakness of both lower limbs so as somebody said was it in the roots was it in the plexus was it affection of multiple peripheral nerves just like we considered the previous patient or was it a muscle disease any pure motor condition you had to keep this possibility in the back of the mind let us see as well as with lumbar sacral radiculopathy what is again is lumbar sacral radiculopathy very unlikely because the weakness is not in the distribution of the roots can you give us some example because patient weakness in the quadriceps is in spade adductus adductus are normal but quadriceps is weak both are separated by the l2 3 radical secondly hip abduction is severely weak it cannot hold against cavity but the dorsiflexion plantar flexion is normal and dorsiflexion is only mildly weak that pattern is very unusual for a an l phase of radical epilepsy So let us see whether it could be a plexopathy in this patient. <coughs> plexopathy is possible. Plexopathy sometimes can have very patchy affection. Can often you not respect a root, you not respect a nerve or pattern. But is odd is that is bilateral. Usually plexopathy is a unilateral, <coughs> and there is no pain. Usually it presents by pain in the thigh or limbs. But the possibility totally can be a road load, but it's a little odd in this patient. what is again is multiple nerves has to be concerned previously no sensor if no sensory agree but suppose i presume there is a pure motor nerves are affected multifocal motor neuropathy same flexion adduction of the thigh yeah i think the point is that it is possible but the point is that see the weakness is not in the distribution of the nerves yes could he flexions are so weak that means superior gluteal nerve has to be implicated hip abductus has to be inferior gluteal has to be affected and yes got and uh, both uh, common peripheral has to be affected bilaterally but other nerves are all spared so this kind of a pattern does not in the theoretically you can say these nerves are affected affection of both superior inferior gluteal nerves in both cpn and both femoral so theoretically you are right you can get involvement like this to produce these things but practically this is not a pattern of a, and all all the time sparing the sensation 
We have motor neuropathy affecting only confined lower limb, only these nerves. Theoretically possible, logically less likely. So could it be muscle disease? Very unlikely because of the cross asymmetry and the sensory symptom the patient had, like paresthesia in the thigh, and has got a backache, but not the pain in the thigh. And absent angle checks with good power. So absent knee jack with good power. There's also a little odd for a, a myopathy in this patient. Now let us see. Now what is said? So what can be the what like can be radically neuropathy of something like a GBS. Yes, it could be GBS. The GBS the pattern does not fit in with the multiple now. It's something like a proximal press distribution. It does not go in the distribution of a nerve at all. Even the lesions in the nerves and the roots, it may predominantly affect the muscles, the lower limb, proximal muscles, with the distal muscles, less late movement. But that pattern does not fit in with the root pattern nor a nerve pattern because multiple uh, parts are affected. If you look at the GBS patient which you have seen, you see that it does not go for a root distribution, even though you call it as a radical nerve. Actually, it's multiple nerves are affected. Only those nerves which are thickly myelinated are the muscles, sub nerves supplying the proximal muscles. So they are affected first. That is why the proximal muscles are more weak in GPS than distal muscles. Did you get the point? It is not fitting with a nerve, individual nerve, not fitting with a mononeurodist multiple pattern. The nerves which suppress the proximal muscles are thickly myelinated, so they are more vulnerable. They can demyelinate it. They, let's say proximal muscle is more weak than the distal muscle. Okay. But can we get the, this type of pattern of weakness in GBS, so the proximal type? Yes, yes. Yeah. Versus yeah. Hip versus abduction. Yeah. Hip, abdu hip extension, hip abduction, knee hip flexion, and knee extension. Distal muscle is the only thing affected is the dose of it. Plantar flexion is not. But the asymmetry, sir, the flexion. Yeah, of course. Asymmetry is not. Yeah, asymmetry is typically almost all GBS you find asymmetry. If you find exact symmetry, it's less likely for a GBS. Because if you, this is a multifocal demarcation, not like a hereditary neuropathy, where they are symmetrically affected. If you like the nerve condition also, invariably there will be asymmetric, asymmetry. They're never it's symmetry. Now, not the asymmetry in the same limb, sir, that the extension is more, uh, adduction, abduction is more involved, extension is less involved in one limb. That can happen in GBS, sir. No, no. Here it is more affected the right lower limb. I want to say initially was wrong. It was I meant on the right side, not on the left side. See, if you look, the hip abduction is more weak on the right side. Hip, right, and, uh, knee extension is more weak on the right side. Hip extension is also weak on the right side. That's on the left side. Nevertheless, it's affected on the left side. Both knee jacks are absent. See, the, right, the, the, the affected, see the... Uh, the affected muscles have got lost reflex. Unaffected muscles like plantar flexion, the angle jack is preserved. So you would you keep the possibility of right? Otherwise, you can then see is is it that's the best explanation which we can take. Because distribution does not favor a root or multiple nerves to consider or a muscle disease. Okay. You don't agree with my diagnosis of radical neuropathy? Yes. Okay, let us see. So, pure motor repetitive proximal muscle is more proximal for EGBS. Now, what do you want now to confirm GBS? It's already three weeks. Now, conduction should be abnormal. Conduction was done. This is the conduction. The only abnormality was this peroni, the amplitude was on the borderline or just normal. Other all points. So practically, if you look at the MI and NCV, it is normal. Five is the cutoff. It is five and five point five in the parody. All other things are normal. But remember, at proximal conduct, we are doing in the limb muscles the distal part. We are not doing conduction from the thigh, cortis, etc. They are affected the EBC. So we are not doing it. So let us see. And the FA is normal. Normal latency. 
sensory nor so what do you think now why joy is silent joy muslim is silent muslim it could be muslim but the pattern does not fit in with it no? the rose any suggestion still it would be gvs or piston imagination is there okay yeah could be but a pale latency is also no even after three. so what do you want now mri mri okay but in uh, luckily for me patient already taken mri from mills where he came in the mri this is mri it is multiple disc at various levels but they are not this is the disc l2 l3 l3 l4 l4 l5 okay this is also the axial cut this is l1 l2 level this is l2 3 level and this is last one is l3 level this is l3 l4 this is l3 l4 this is l3 on the left side l3 on the right l4 on the right side again l4 l4 l5 on the right side my disc protrusion this is at face on the left the prachapadi scan was done i could not read this thing in way the reported as normal but they put multiple disc protrusion so what do you want me to do now or what would you like to do csf csf as yes, actually said is correct this is the impression they said uh, this dislocation this is the minus protrusion so csf examiner said but patient deferred csf he said i you don't want poke me in the back <laughs> trial of salivatron trial of salivatron yes of all like Oh, but we have, to, we have to confirm. No, we have to tell. What do you need to tell? Is it GBS? Then you can give steroid. I have no objection to give steroid for GBS also. I have seen it improving with IV means that we have solved it. But uh, CSF how will it help, sir? But CSF is not willing. What to do? But uh, even if we if is willing, huh? how how is it going to help? Okay. No, let us see. What do you want to do now? Now, what is the thing is that when we all do you know, see the nerve conduction, we only see the values, correct? We never look at the waveform. Suppose if you get a dispersed potential, it may be no, it may not be given in the value. They may only give the amplitude is five, but we don't know whether the potential is dispersed. The potential is dispersed means it's an image, correct? So what you have to do is go back and see the waveform in the EMG lab. So that is what I did. I went for look for the waveform. There is no dispersion of the waveform. It's both conperoneal, TVL. There is mild dispersion, not very really convincing dispersion. Again, left TVL no dispersion. Right side is a more affected limb. There is mild dispersion, but not very much convincing. So, what do you want to me to do now? So, can we get dispersion till third week also, sir? Pardon? Till third week also, can we get the dispersion? Yes, 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 yes. In fact, the the NCV study may persist even after clinical recovery. He has not recovered, but still, it is not there. So, what what we always do is what is the ideal test to find out possible conduction abnormality? Is a thing, right? If you have latency, okay, that's what we all do. H reflex, sir. Now let us see what we what I did. It. So we look for always look for if a persistence and chronic dispersion. This we hardly ever do that. Remember that. Suppose you have got a. Ten fibers are uh, theoretically sorry. Say ten fibers are in the proximal root. If two fibers are spaced, not blocked, you get a normal latency, FF latency. The other say eight fibers may be lost, blocked, 
but if you let me know so you have to always look for a chrono dispersion as well as a persistence out of the 10 fibers in the nerve fail how many are contacting that is also important that is fa persistence so let us see this particular patient this is the fa from the left tb normal good fa persistence no chrono dispersion all almost coming in the same time that is a unaffected left tibial nerve this is a right tibial nerve again plantar flexus and normal tibial nerve is unaffected this is a good persistence all all fa is elicited in all the all the stimulation and there's not much of a dispersion now this is the left peroneal see this is the fa you can make out one fa hardly here but that latency is normal all other waves are not present this is the same patient so unless if you the value comes as normal if you let and see but you see the persistence is very low out of the 10 only one you can one or two you can see there so this is the other side right around here you can see again hardly you can make out one or two three things here again doubtful details the in the machine will read it as a normal latency here because the marker is here so what do you want to say most of the fa is blocked in the left and right peroneal compared to the tbl remember the affected muscles are separated by the peroneal and not the tbl you compare this thing the right tbl versus the right peroneal see the difference between the value between the two the amplitude as well as the persistence we compare the left tbl versus the left peroneal now let's see whether this can affect the other nerves also and look at the ulna now the fave the ulna now the value is here normal value but see other waves are all blocked this is clinically unaffected still that fave is a fave uh, persistence is low so in your practice when you get a normal fave your clinical suspicion is strong for gps or something like a dmn neuropathy always look for to go to the lab see the fa persistence and the chrono dispersion chrono dispersion is that and the, uh, the time between the onset of uh, the fa in various uh, tracings one fiber may be can maybe uh, coming here the other may be coming in the cultural pictures also so even the left ulna shows decrease in the persistence of fa so the lesson is that any electro diagnostic values given by the lab do not fit in with the clinical diagnosis check for which check the wave sums again personally for this two three slides i just copied for for you this thing if a person is a measure of the number of fa's obtained per number of stimulations normal fa person is about 80 to 90% and always above 50% however which is much below 50% and this is the this and also the other thing then uh, this is fa persistence normally this is fa but here see only two has got fa persistence the chrono dispersion is the difference between the minimal and the fast that is the fastest and the maximal that is slowest response the first to fail to the last to fail normal chrono dispersion is up to 4 milliseconds the upper limb and 6 milliseconds the lower limb this is the chrono dispersion so here this is the first to potential fastest to potential this is the uh, slowest to potential this dispersion should not be more than 0.4 that's if you gain it's prolonged that tells you that some of the fibers are conducting fast like this some of the fibers are conducting slow again what we measure is fa latency is that measures only a first potential the only one potential is coming early you call it as a normal fa latency but that should not be the correct way of interpreting the proximal demanding lesions okay it's fine diagnosis demanded in order for the affected proximal segments patients put on steroid then uh, i don't know what happened to the patient yeah in many yes in fact by even when we came here the patient was static so any questions sir any role of x reflex in such patients sir x reflex the role of x reflex in such patients yeah if the in here the tibial nerves are unaffected so there's some point in doing x reflex in that uh, in this particular patient the plantar flexors are good power
sir in those those two peroneal sacs sir yeah. there was no ff seen at all no only some yeah in fact in fact actually what is it is i also this is can see the ff here the ulna now but here there is some suspicion of uh, wave also the wave these were taken they record, the machine has recorded it as a uh, abnormal wave and then a technician what did you say you got the value you can take again return the type the value and came out here very suspicion we are not very sure about it we ask you what can be a fib it could be a fib that's coming in the same latency now if the other thing also there is one of these waves is coming here this is coming here but here also multiple is coming so i am not sure if the fib is present mm-hmm. or not small small waves are there multiple multiple so the machine will record the correct time that will come so it will record in the same way the technician will keep the print out beautiful print out as if it unless we see this graph we will miss it so would a emg help in this emg is not going to help because because whatever it is it's a new minute if it's a pure demination emg can be normal not in a way so only thing is that uh, the recruitment will be below unless it's a denoted you won't get emg is not going to get at some point you can get the denovation findings like demyelination emg is not going to get differentiate myopathy from neuropathy you can the emg can be helpful in such cases where your dd is one of myopathy here then emg will help otherwise the role of emg is to find out if element lesion to whether it is axonopathy or a demyelinating neuropathy demyelinating neuropathy you get only decreased uh, conduction block you can look for it that's the in cs but emg wise you can find decreased uh, recruitment Okay, any questions? Okay, then shall we call it a day? Yes, sir. Okay, good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. We'll meet next week. Good night, sir. Good night. 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 Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you, Ned Monster. Thank you, Ned.